Cruz now has seven home runs and 25 RBIs in 35 games. Let's not overthink this, okay? Good morning to you. Good Wednesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Pirates. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or hockey. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Penguins where you found this. Pirates 5, Brewers 3. Kind of an odd evening at PNC Park with the Brewers staking a 3-0 lead. Corbin Burns, the reigning Cy Young winner, looking like he's just going to mow down the home team all night long. More Josh Van Meter in the lineup after a Major League Baseball trade deadline that somehow left him and Yoshi Tsutsugo untouched and still in the clubhouse for some insane reason. And then, boom, there it went. Pitch was low and away. Change up. Had to reach out with one long arm and just poke, just contact. The barrel of the bat hits the ball, and there it goes, like magic, straight away center. Unbelievable. As many times as he does this, And I'm including footage of what he's done in the minors or what he's done even in Bradenton. It's not something that really resonates. It almost looks like CGI. But there it went. And just like that, because there were two guys aboard, it's 3-3. And it's a whole new game. And everything else that he does or did doesn't matter. Yes, of course, you want Cruz to be batting higher than 209. You want him to reach base more frequently. You want him to be more selective so that he doesn't need to lunch with one hand for an outside changeup to homer to get a hit. But there's time for that, and there's no room whatsoever in this equation for a backward step. That's the point that I can't make strongly enough. When Cruz was demoted out of spring training to the minors, I was in the clubhouse down there at Lee Com Park, and you could see in his face what had happened. You could see he knew, and you could see the disappointment. I mean, I don't want to make this too dramatic or whatever, but Arguably devastation. He had teammates around him. They're trying to console him. And he had no interest whatsoever in a backward step. So he goes to Indy and he slumps for a month, several weeks, pretty well into the second month. And on one hand, you could have the Pirates brass semi-crowing that, well, see, we told you he wasn't ready, but you also have the very real possibility that he just wasn't interested in a backward step because he knows what he can do at this level. And now he's here and he's showing on a fairly regular basis what he can do at this level. So guess which level is just right for him to continue doing exactly that? This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern that's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of Steak on a Stone, an eating experience, underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800-degree stone and You do the rest. It's a ton of fun. It's a great meal. And it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. Look, now more than ever, these final two months of this long lost season don't mean a thing. They just don't. Ben Charrington almost came close to saying that yesterday, although he put it in exactly the opposite terms by stressing how really, really important these last two months are. (laughs) Whoever says anything like that, unless they're defending something, right? 
Cruz has the opportunity, provided he stays healthy and everything else, over these two months to double his season's output, meaning just for plate appearances, for defensive plays, for base running, for everything, to see more major league pitches, to see more major league pitchers and how they attack him. And he's going to screw up. He just is. Most rookies do. This was what Derek Shelton had to say after the game last night about that inning in which Bly Madras and Cal Mitchell, a couple of other younger players, worked walks off Burns to get aboard so that, you know, the home run would be a three-run home run. Yeah, I mean, a really big moment. I mean, I think we had a really big moment that inning with three rookies. I mean, for him to take, you know, what, in 87, 88 mile an hour changeup that was looked like it was off the plate away and hit it dead center field uh, off the, you know, reigning Cy Young Award winner. Uh, It's a huge moment. And I think, you know, I want to make sure we highlight the two at-bats before that because with Madris and Mitchell, you know, earlier in the game, we talk about, you know, rookies are going to do things that that frustrate you and then they're going to do things that make you smile. And the first time through, Burns got him to chase and got him, you know, with the runner at third and really didn't throw him, didn't throw either one on very many strikes. And for them to come back later in the game and have the approach they had, I think that culmination of, you know, three hitters there makes you really excited at times where you can get really frustrated earlier in the game and I give all three of them a ton of credit and then O'Neal finished it. Yeah, that's it. That's a pretty good line from Shelton. I I couldn't agree with him more emphatically on that. He's going to have to be the one who sits there and answers when Cruz gets picked off second base or when Diego Castillo messes up or Rodolfo Castro messes up. He's going to have to be the one that sits at that podium while everyone else everywhere is typing angrily about lack of fundamentals and lack of development when all it is is lack of experience. Oh, and by the way, if it is lack of fundamentals and lack of development, it's a reflection of the people running the minor league system, not the major league manager for crying out loud right when they first arrive. But he also knows that there's a payoff. And when it's someone who's as naturally, physically gifted, as Cruz, there's a huge payoff. So what you do is you be patient with the kid. You say, hey, listen, this pitch that you swung at or this pitch that you've been swinging at regularly or this approach that you're taking when you get up to the plate where you're just taking the first pitch fastball right down the pipe? (laughs) No, no. And you do it in bites. You don't overwhelm him. You don't flood him. You don't have him think to himself, well, there's just too much to process here. I'm going to get drowned by all of this information. And that doesn't matter. If you think Cruz is a, a genius or he's dumb or whatever it is, if you think Cal Mitchell is a genius or he's dumb or whatever, these things don't really enter into the equation in either direction. By the way, I don't think either of them is remotely dumb. It's about the game speeding up on you, a terminology that you hear a lot from people in development and even at the major league level. They have to watch out for the game speeding up on them, meaning there's just too much happening, and they instead just kind of freeze and go into like a a state of stasis. You know what? You know who was there? Jack Sawinski before he got sent back. That is not what we've seen from Cruz. I have seen one completely awful game from Cruz, and that was the finale that I covered out in Denver a couple weeks ago where he was just completely overmatched by everything and everyone that was thrown at him. And he bounced right back. Boom, just like that. Go through the game logs. You'll see that he hasn't slumped, really, at all. He finds a way to bounce back, at least with a hit or two, in the very next game. He just needs time. Leave him alone. And when we come back, J1Q. And, you know, 
I'm not going to do a J1Q today. I've got a couple lined up. They're pretty good questions, and we'll get to those this week. Vin Scully died last night, for those of you who weren't up late enough to get that news. It came from the Scully family and, of course, from his beloved Dodgers. There's nothing that someone as insignificant as me can add to what this man represented, not just for L.A. or Brooklyn or Jackie Robinson or Hank Aaron and his 715th home run or Kirk Gibson's unforgettable World Series shot as he limped around the bases. So I'll very much leave the macro and everything that he meant to the sport, but really to American sport singular. Um, There's not many announcers, uh, certainly not in baseball, which is always localized, uh, who transcended their games the way Vin did. I'm instead going to share with you a personal nugget here that I hope you'll appreciate in its own small way. When you go to Dodger Stadium, And you enter at the top of the structure and you go down the elevator, which is wild because it's built into the side of a hill. One of the first faces to greet you in the press box, no matter how puny you are on the baseball writing scale, is Vin. You get there at around, oh, I don't know, let's say 2.45 p.m. before a 3.30 opening of the visiting clubhouse. And Vin knows that that's when the visiting writers will show. And Vin would come out, somehow remember my name, and my name's no picnic, right? And sit next to me and ask how everything's going and everything. And it wasn't just being all nice and gentlemanly and proper, which he was in every single setting that I'd experienced. He wanted to ask me, stuff about the Pirates. Now, anybody who's followed the Pirates and their run of success slash failure in that particular venue knows that it hasn't gone particularly well. This year was very much the exception, that sweep out there. Usually the Pirates get their brains blasted out. But Vin wanted to know about everyone who was in the starting lineup And the card would usually be out by that point. He wanted to know some background stuff, some stories that he could share with his listeners, which was really neat because you're sharing this stuff with Vin and you know that at some point or other over the course of the evening, Vin Scully is going to share your stuff, right? In the Vin Scully voice and back behind the press box in the dining area. If you went back there just for a Dodger dog or whatever it is, I used to manufacture these strange coffees, this machine that they had, and I'd I'd hear him. You could hear the broadcast in there. And there's Vin reading a story about Freddy Sanchez. And did you know that when Freddy Sanchez was a child that he had difficulty walking and whatever? And I'm going, yeah, yeah, I did know that. I shared that with you. It's amazing to hear it in your voice. But that wasn't what impressed me the most either. When we were done with the stories and the everything else, you know what he cared most about? And people who are in this line of work or who have ever spent even a millisecond in this line of work will appreciate this to the point of having the same goosebumps on their arm that I do right now. He wanted to pronounce every single name exactly the way the athlete pronounces it. And that for anybody who's ever been part of the media or part of radio specifically knows that's everything. Because you are showing the proper respect, not only for the individual, but also for your profession. And I have witnessed people as they 
get older, they'll get a little bit lazier or they'll see there's a bad team in town and they won't take the time to learn about them, to treat them professionally and to share with their own audience what they've learned and to conduct themselves a certain way. And believe you me, if I was even the tiniest bit uncertain about, let's say somebody was just called up from Indianapolis or whatever, I would admit it. Even if this is somebody that I'd been covering for a while, I needed to be a billion percent sure of this player's enunciation on every single syllable. And that was that. It was time to go down to the clubhouse and Vin would get up and thank me for my time. He thanked me. He thanked me. And I'm like, I thank you. This whole day was just made worthwhile by you sitting with me. I can't believe that you did. And then later on, before first pitch, back in that media lounge area that I described, which is just like this crude little cafeteria. It's been that way for years. It hasn't been changed. He would be one of the first guys to just grab a tray and plop it down right next to you and start talking about more baseball. As authentic as authentic gets. That's all I have for you on this great man. I would recommend strongly reading up, listening to some of his calls over the course of the day. Whether you're an older fan who's familiar with his work or a younger fan who doesn't know as much. If you're a baseball fan, you are a Vin Scully fan. We'll have another one of these shows tomorrow.